Thank you for joining us here at the Pentecostals for this week's message. Our desire is to make a difference by loving God, creating community, growing in truth, and serving our world. If God has blessed you through this ministry, we want to encourage you to share it with someone and even consider partnering with us to help POR continue delivering God's Word all around the world. Check out our website, porva.org, to discover more about us and our ministries. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoyed today's message. I want to say one more uh, bit of honor here, and that's to give honor to all the servicemen and women that have given their life for our country and our freedom. So thankful. I never want to take that for granted. So this message this morning is going to be for a select group of people here today. Just um, it's not going to be maybe for everybody. And if um, you're not in this category, um, you don't you don't have to really listen that much. What you can do is you can feel like, you know what, if I'm hammering a point home and you're saying, man, that point just sounds like that should go for that person over there. I want you to point to that person and be like, that's for you. That's for you. So. So what I want you to do is go ahead and practice that right now. Go ahead and point to somebody and be like, that's for you. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure. <laughs> so now uh, that we're going to, I'm going to put some of these people who I'm preaching to today, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. I don't want to embarrass you, but may put you on the spot. So I'm going to get you to raise your hand. And if you're in this group, you have to commit. If you raise your hand, you are going to receive this message today and apply it to your life. So y'all commit to that? You, okay, we've got good commitment. Okay, so here it goes. If you're in this category, if you have been serving the Lord for less than 92 years, raise your hand right there. Raise your hand. Okay. Okay, you guys committed. I saw it. I saw you guys. Were, okay. Those that more than that, you don't have to even listen today. You can do whatever you want. Point to other people. We're going to be reading from Exodus 14, chapter uh, 14 and verse 10 through 14. I'm going to be going through the New Living Translation today. I'm going to give you a little bit of preface to what's happening in our text. We're going to be picking up the story where Pharaoh has let the, the children of Israel go. They were slaves. He's let them go, and he said, go ahead and, uh, you know, you guys can leave. And then he decided to bring them on back. He says, come on, come on back. Well, I, I um, changed my mind. Don't want to do that anymore. So the Israelites have the Red Sea in front of them, the Egyptian army behind them, and mountains on either side. So they're right smack dab in the middle. Somebody say in the middle. Let's read Exodus 14, verses 10 through 14, starting with verse 10. As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and panicked when they saw the Egyptians taking, overtaking them. They cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, Why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we, didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? We said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. Verse 13, but Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen Again, somebody said amen. amen. One more verse. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. I'm going to preach today from the title, Finding Meaning in the Middle. Finding Meaning in the Middle. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for our pastor being back home. Thank you for the many men and women that have died for us. But today, I ask that you would speak to us specifically in this service. You have a special word for those that are here, and I believe it's for all of us that we need to hear. I ask that your word come forth and pierce and, and break up the ground, God, and let it fall on good ground and grow. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And everybody said amen. amen. So anybody here been to the airport lately? 
You been to the airport lately? Yeah, there's a few of you, good travelers here. So I want to tell you about the fruits of the Spirit real quick. The fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Well, it is my belief that the airport is designed to pluck those fruits right from you. <laughs> I think that's the idea. It's meant to just test our salvation, maybe even designed to help us lose our salvation. So if you're in a hurry, you know, and you're in a hurry, you're, in a, you're, you're trying your best to catch a flight, I think it's possible that the enemy has put that person behind the counter that types two words per minute, and they're moving at the pace of a dying snail, and you're trying your best to get to that flight, and they are saying, I'm here to steal your joy. <laughs> Somehow they don't mind charging you a baggage fee. They, are, they, they like charging that baggage fee, but it's kind of neat because they charge you. A, I can see them in a business meeting, and they're all sitting around the boardroom, and they're saying, we're, let's start charging baggage, baggage fee. But here's the catch. We're going to charge them to lose their luggage. So that's going to be great. We'll just, that's basically what's happening. I'm paying them to lose my luggage. So I've got a few personal plane pet peeves. So here we, here's a few of them. The person that gets on the plane that has the unmitigated goal to sit next to you with some nasty smelling food. You're sitting right there and you're trapped up next to them and they've got their plastic fork, they've got their napkin and they've got their reheated fish sitting right next to you, you know? Anybody ever smell reheated heated fish? Shoo, Lord have mercy. How about you're on the plane and you're sitting there and you've got yourself a seat right next to you. And you're real excited about this. And you've got somebody here and your seat's empty and you've got somebody already here, but you're saying, man, Lord, come on, somebody. <laughs> We're praying. Hey, you ever sat there? I've been praying. I'm like, Lord, shut that door. Shut that door, Lord. <laughs> I know there, somebody, somebody pray, pray with me. We gotta shut this door. We gotta shut that door. And sure enough, you know, somebody else comes in and there's an empty seat up there and they sit in that seat and you're just like, yes, Lord, you're hearing my prayer. You're hearing my prayer. And you know that door is about to shut and sure enough, one more person walks in and they come in and I'm going to tell you what, of course, there's seats over there, there's seats over there. They're going to sit right there. That kills me. That's a personal plain pet peeve for me. How about this one? Now this one, y'all, I'm going to get in trouble for this one, y'all. Y'all, y'all pray for me, all right? sitting on the plane and somebody comes and sits next to you y'all don't 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 judge me and they've got a crying baby <laughs> and it goes to town right there well listen so i'm i'm on a flight over to <laughs> i'm on a flight over to the midwest and I'm going to preach a revival over there, and I'm just, you know, having a good time. I was like, this is going to be a good flight. I, get me, I, got, I got the seat right in the middle, folks. So I'm sitting here in the middle. Got a lady sitting right here. The aisle's over here. And then sure enough, you know, I'm waiting. I'm thinking this seat's going to be empty. It's going to be a blessing from God. Nope. Comes sits down. Got, got her little baby. And that's fine. That's fine. I love babies. That's fine. The baby, you know, it starts to screaming and stuff before we went on our way up, starts to screaming. I said, ha, 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 yes, Lord, I prepared. I got my head noise-canceling headphones, somebody. So I said, I'm all set. Got my noise-canceling headphones on. The baby's screaming. I'm looking at it, just, you know. <laughs> and just relaxing on the plane, y'all. Yeah, oh, man, I'm on the way up. We are not even in the, f we're not even at cruising altitude yet. And that baby takes care of some business. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. I shouldn't be saying that up here, but it was, it was crazy, y'all. So we're sitting there taking care of business right there on the way up the plane. I said, oh, Lord, have mercy on my soul. <laughs> so all I'm thinking is if we can get to cruising altitude, that seatbelt sign will turn off and they will be able to take care of this situation. So I'm praying, come on, seatbelt sign. Come on, let the light turn off, floor. And, well, the light turns off, and she stays seated. And the light's still off. Y'all, this carried on for approximately 45 minutes. I was counting them, y'all. I was counting every minute. I'm saying, okay, so I've got, I've got my neck pillow. Yeah, I'm one of those travelers. I got my neck pillow. 
and I've got it around my face like this, and I'm just, I pr- I'm, I'm trying to pretend like I'm trying to sleep forward, see, but I've got my neck pillow all shoved up in my face, and I'm just praying, Lord, somebody help me. Hey, I look over to the lady beside me, and she's got a little, a little pillow or something, and she's got that thing stuffed up in her face, and they're doing this. The people over beside me, everybody's just all around, oh, oh, Lord, oh, Lord. So she finally gets up. I think she got the hint. It's a beautiful thing. Y'all, the baby comes back, 20 minutes of goodness, takes care of business again. And that one lasts for an hour. (laughs) Somebody help me. Hey, I'm going to tell you here today, I am a survivor. I survived that flight. I made it to preach the gospel at that revival. And I'm here today to tell the story. So I know, I know, I'm so sorry. I know pastor's gonna, gonna get me for that one, talking about that one from the platform. But that all happened in the middle seat. How many, how many knows it's not, it, this is not the seat you want, it's the middle seat. The life of, the Christian, of a Christian is often lived out in the middle seat. If there's someone that's wrestling with the weight of being stuck in the middle here today, in the, in the middle of not where you used to be, but not where you know God has a plan for you to be. How many has ever been there? You say, I'm not where I used to be, but I know that God's got something greater for me planned. (laughs) See, you're seeing the Israelites, they're wrestling with the weight of being stuck in the middle. They're not in Egypt where they used to be, but they're not in the promised land where God has them planned to be. The real you seems to come out in the middle. So I, I hoped I passed that test of being really passive aggressive of stuffing a pillow in my face. But that is the real us seems to come out when we're in the middle. One of the clearest biblical pictures of salvation is the story of the Israelites coming out of Egypt into the promised land. For 400 years, somebody say 400 years. For 400 years, they were in slavery and bondage. And in one moment, all of a sudden, they went from being slaves to being saved. I want want you to make sure you get that picture. 400 years, folks, they went from being slaves to being saved in a moment. So I ask you this question. How can we sit here today and say, God, I know you want to do a work in me. I know you want to change me, but I've been in this way for quite some time now. I've been dealing with what I've been dealing with for a while. You don't understand. I've been kind of stuck in my ways for a while. I'm not sure if he can change me. Has it been 400 years? No. God's saying, I can change someone in a minute, in an instant. So what God wants to bring you out of, there's, when he wants to bring you out, there's nothing. There's no bondage. There's no stronghold. There's no broken past. There's nothing that can stop God from bringing you out. So what allowed the children of Israel to come out of Egypt? What allowed that to happen? What was the, what was the catalyst that made that happen? Well, did the children of Israel have their mess all taken care of and their stuff all together and before God would deliver them? Did they get it all right? Did they get their life all situated and squared before God would take care of them? Think about it. God, God uh, um, I, I know that you want to deliver me, but first let me get, let me get my stuff together. Here, let me, let me help everybody understand something. We can't get our stuff together. We were designed to where we might can help ourselves some, but God is the only one that can fix us. We were set up that we can't read enough self-help books to fix the things that we've got going on in our lives. We can't watch enough daytime TV to try to figure out what those talk shows might can help us with. None of those things are going to help. Only God can help us fix the things that we're dealing with. So let me ask you again, did the children of Israel have their stuff together before God would help them? What's the answer there? No. So... Was it their level of faith? They had, I don't believe it was. It wasn't just their faith. There's a lot of different faith levels in that group. 
We're saying, God, I know if I have this X amount of faith and this and this and this, and then you'll help me. But, but let's look at this. The children of Israel. You know you had some of those children of Israel that had high faith. Okay? They're walking through the Red Sea on dry ground. And then during the time, they're just looking at everybody and saying, I told you so. I knew God was going to do this. I knew God was going to you know, deliver us and all this other stuff. And there's another person that's saying, oh, man, I had no idea this was going to happen. I never, I never believed it. Moses, don't you drop that staff. We're going we're gonna to drown. You know, they're scared to death. But there was different levels of faith that were happening in that environment. So I don't believe that faith is what the only catalyst that allowed that God to set them free. They were set free because God is attracted to their need and it had a purpose for their life. Come on, somebody say, God's got a purpose for me. They were crying out to a God that they had heard of but not yet personally experienced. They'd heard about Abraham. They'd heard about Isaac. They'd heard about Jacob. They'd heard about these situations where God had done amazing things, but they had not personally experienced that yet. So it wasn't that they had it all together. It wasn't that they had high levels of faith. Somebody here is thinking that God won't take you to your promised land until you get it together. Now stay with me for a moment. Some of you here have been saying, God, I, I know you're calling me and I know you're wanting to do great things and you've got some special plans for my life, but I need to get some things squared away first. Here's the thing. To me, that's a lot like saying, you know, Harvard saying, listen, I will let you into Harvard, but first you need to have a Harvard degree. Okay, so we'll let you in, but go ahead and have a degree in Harvard from our school first. It makes no sense. God's saying, you can't come to me and say, I'm going to wait till I get it all together first, and then I'll help you get it together. No, he's saying, I'm the one that fixes. If you need fixing, come to me. The whole Bible is just one book. It's just one book pointing to one man, and his name is what? Jesus. The Old Testament is just a shadow of what Jesus is in the New Testament. So let me explain shadows just in case you don't know what a shadow is. I believe you do. Is Okay, I've got a shadow up here. It's on the stage. You probably can't really see it. But it does what I do, okay? So if I'm moving and I'm jumping around and I'm hop, skipping, and jumping, my shadow is doing the exact same thing. Now, if my shadow ever stops doing what I'm doing, you guys need to pray for me because something <laughs> freaky is going on. But there's two things, there's two proofs that... Uh, a shadow of a, is a proof of two things. First of all, that I'm real, that I'm an object. And number two, that there is a source of light in the room. You can't get distinctive features from a shadow. You look at my shadow, and you're not going to be able to tell my eye color. You're not going to be able to tell my hair color. You're not going to be able to tell how pointy my nose is. You're not going to be able to know all that stuff from my shadow. So that's why when you read about certain individuals that in the Old Testament that do great exploits, they are not God. They just are a preview of a coming attraction. So I'm, I'll explain. Hold in there. There's just a preview of Jesus, which is coming next. So Pharaoh here is a shadow or a parallel of Satan. Egypt becomes the shadow of sin. Which is why Pharaoh wants them to stay there. Now, let's go back for a few moments when we were reading the scripture. You see how Pharaoh said, go ahead. Go ahead, children of Israel. You can go ahead and go. But then he changed his mind and said, hold on. Come on back. And if we're seeing here that Pharaoh is the, the type of sh or shadow of Satan and Egypt is sin, Satan always will say, you can go for a time, you can go for a season, and we can go ahead and, and pretend like you're free, but I always will pull you back to Egypt. Moses here becomes the shadow of Jesus, which was born for no other reason than salvation and liberty and deliverance for a generation. So this is Moses. His purpose was the same as Jesus's purpose in the ways of saving a generation. The Old Testament Passover, which was instituted under Moses, is where they would take an innocent lamb and they would sprinkle the blood over the wooden door frame of door, door so that the death angel would pass over. That's 
just giving you a preview of another innocent lamb that would be slain, but his blood was not shed over a wooden doorpost. It was shed on a wooden cross so that the death angel would pass over us. The wages of sin is death, and God said, I will slay my, allow myself to be slain and my blood to be over that wooden cross so that you would have power over sin. You would have power over death. You would have power over sickness. You would have power over poverty. The Red Sea that they walk through, you guys getting the picture? The Red Sea that they walk through, that's just a shadow of baptism. Somebody say baptism. It's just saying that when I pass through the water, the old me is still in Egypt and the new me is coming out of the water ready to step into what God has called me to do. The old me says, I'm going to pass through this, and when I get through the other side, I'm going to be free of what was bind, but had me bound in Egypt. Yeah. Let, me, let me mention something to you here. You know, and this is something I see. You know you can spot somebody uh, that, that has been set free because what, because what we see with the Israelites, they get to the other side, and what do they do? They shout exuberantly. They shout, they get excited, they, they know that God has just delivered them. That's how I can spot someone that has remembered what God has brought them from because they're shouting and they're saying, God, I remember what you brought me from. I can look back and I can see that all the king's horses and all the king's men are drowning in the ocean because they were coming to get me, but you will not let them. I am so thankful to know that when here, when we see people rejoicing and we see them shouting and I see the, the excitement happening, that's just a remembrance that God, how far you brought me from. That's why it's usually easy to spot them. And I, 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 I want us to sometimes get those flashbacks, I, I, to get a flashback of what used to be and how far we've come. Thank God. I, let's, let's thank God for one moment. Thank you, God, for taking us from Egypt, God, and delivering us to where we are today. So once the thrill is gone and the waters have receded and the service was over, and, and if you've ever had an encounter with God, you, you have to ask yourself this question. Who am I now? Somebody say, who am I now? I'm no longer a slave. I'm no longer bound and chained. I'm now saved. But how do you walk in that? This is where I'm getting to, and I'm, I'm, I'm taking it somewhere. How do I walk in that? Especially since I've been a slave for so long. Especially since I had this way of thinking for so long. The way that I walked, the way that I acted, the way that I was treated. How do I walk in this new way? There's another way to say it. I know I'm out of Egypt, but how do I get Egypt out of me? This is what a lot of church people deal with, and I, I, this is important why I had you raise your hand early on, because somebody's going to pass this off to somebody that's brand new in the church, but everybody here deals with it. Everyone here deals with we were once in Egypt, and now we're trying to find out how to make sure all of Egypt is out of us. When you're out of Egypt and Egypt is not out of you, it, it can be frustrating. It can make you feel like you're a little bit schizophrenic. You're saying, well, God, I know I love you with all my heart, but I'm still dealing with this. I love you and I'm trying to serve you, but I got this going on. And I've got these thoughts and I've got this action and I've got this going on in my life. How come? So I, I've heard somebody call it a if I, then why. Somebody say, if I, then why. If I, then why? It's an if I, then why statement. If I have the peace of God, then why am I so stressed out? Come on. You know, are you? Somebody here like, no, not me. If I have the peace, you ever ask yourself, if I have the peace of God, how come I'm so stressed? If I have Jehovah Jireh, my provider, why am I struggling to pay my bills? Oh, y'all acting like, mm. That is the way we act oftentimes. God, I, that's the question we get asked in the office more than anything just about. Is all these things, God, if I've been trying to serve God, but I'm struggling in this area. I'm giving you the answer as to why that is. So if I'm saved, then why do I sometimes act and, 
and think and do things that don't seem safe. It's indicative of the fact that you are out of Egypt, but Egypt is still coming out of you. What a lot of people don't understand about Christianity is initially, and get this, initially, Christianity is a change of status more than it is a change of behavior. You were, they were in Egypt. They were slaves, and that was their status. In a moment, God set them free, and they were saved. New status. That's what they were before. Now they've got a new one. The challenge is that before they get to the promised land, how uh, can they get their behavior to come into alignment with their new status? How can their behavior act like they're, it, they are now saved? So the challenge for, that each of us have this morning is that we need to get our behavior, or every morning, to get our behavior to come into alignment with the status that God's given us. So that is a process. Everybody say process. I'm, I'm preaching this morning. I'm teaching and I'm preaching. So you guys staying with me? We're teaching some. That's a process. The process that God says, I'm trying to somehow make it to where your actions and your behavior comes into alignment with the status that I'm given I've given you. So don't give up because you're in process. I, I, I went through and I prayed for every one of these seats last night. And I, I, I asked God to anoint every one of them. And I prayed that your individual faces, individual people here today, that God would give a word specifically for you. And I believe this is a word for many of you right here, right now. Don't give up just because you are in process. It is a process that you're going through. Trust God, even though you're uncomfortable while you're stuck in the middle, why it's the awkward place of not being that where you used to be or where God has called you to be. He's trying to get us to our destination. I wish that walking with God was a lot like Pop-Tarts. I do. You know, you put, <laughs> I was like, I really want some tarty goodness in me in the morning for breakfast. And, oh, let me I was gonna take that off. And then take it one, and then take it two, and then push down. Pop. Oh, there's my tarts. And there you go. And it's the way it is. But somebody said, God's a whole lot more oven than he is microwave or toaster. God, God's going to take his time. He doesn't just say, hey, let me pop it in real quick and let me just see if somebody pop in here one service and let me just go through a good prayer meeting. I come out, wow, my behavior is now changed. I'm done. I'm all set. I'm walking on the clouds and I've got angels' wings. That's not the way it works. It's a process. If you're going to be who God has called you to be, you have to be willing and be committed to that process. You can't let the enemy convince you that you're not called or that you're not the child of God just because of some of the things that you're struggling with. This is important, okay? We're gonna, I'm going to clarify both sides in a moment, but hear me. Just because we're not shouting doesn't mean that God's not speaking to you specifically right now, okay? You cannot allow the, word, uh, the, the voice of the enemy to tell you that just because you're dealing with a process and you're going through some of these changes, I don't care how long you've been in this thing, if it's, you're brand new or you've been there a long time, just because you're going through something that you're not a child of God, that you're not someone that, will, that he loves. Listen, how many here, when your child messes up, you just kick him to the curb? How many here says, no matter what happens with my son, in no point does it change the fact that he's still my son. At no point am I saying, London, I, 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 you know what? That was the last straw. You spilled your food again. It's over. No way. I'm going to try my best to convince him to change his ways and do my best to model for him how he can do things differently. But in no point at all do I say you are now no longer my child. We have to be committed to the process and know that God will still love us through all of it. Anybody here uh, that wasn't born in the USA? Anybody here? Oh, we got a few. Oh, we got a few. Exciting. Um, anybody here that did not sing to themselves, born in the USA, when I said that? No? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I'm glad Pastor wasn't in here for that one. So, 
I, I, let me just use some, some uh, uh, a fictitious person, fictitious person for example. There's, let's just say somebody is coming to America from Ma uh, Mongolia, and there's from some vi village in Mongolia, and um, they go and take their citizenship test, and they get that right, and they stamp their forehead, and they are now citizens of the United States of America. You guys are looking at me like, they really stamp their forehead? <laughs> Kidding. So they don't stamp their forehead, but they're now citizens of the United States of America. Now, let me ask you, do, do they wake up the next morning acting like a 100% natural born citizen? No citizen is going to be changing their accent overnight. Now, as soon as they become a citizen, all of a sudden they're just talking just like a, a regular, oh, oh, hey, you sound like you're from Indiana. <laughs> just, wow. Oh, Wisconsin. So this is... The United States citizen has probably never been to a baseball game, probably never been to a football game, probably never been to a 4th of July picnic. They probably have no idea what Michael Jordan's number is. Now, if you guys don't know that, y'all going to get, y'all going to get, uh, I'm going to pray for you. You better know Michael Jordan's number, all right? They probably never had pumpkin spice latte or pumpkin spice anything for that matter. They've probably never been to a Sam's or a Costco. Now, listen, they're, <laughs> they're going to Costco and they're going in there and they, if, if, if they're a real citizen, they would know that you go into Costco and then you're gonna go buy, you're like, I need to go get some toilet paper and they end up buying 72 rolls of toilet paper and they find themselves with a, with a flat cart, you know, the little push buggy flat cart. Like, here, come on, roll it over here. I gotta get this massive roll on here. And then they've got, why not, while we're in Costco, pick up a hot tub, pick up a 50 gallon drum of dog food and some bananas. That's American right there. <laughs> you know? Go into a Costco looking for some milk and come out with a trampoline. <laughs> You're not a true citizen until you go and blow up a Costco like that. Man, oh man. It is funny to watch people come out with a thing of bananas sitting on top of a big screen TV. <laughs> Like, man. So the enemy likes for you to, to doubt your citizenship in the kingdom of God just because you have areas of weakness in your life. He wants you to doubt that you're a citizen just because overnight or just because through some time you don't have all of the, uh, all of the characteristics, every aspect of your life to look like you are a natural born citizen. There are times that it, there, it takes time. It takes a, a process for you to go through. And we're looking here and we're saying, well, my goodness, they, they've been a citizen now for two weeks. I don't understand why they still don't, you know, look like they've been in this thing their whole life. The devil is a liar. I'm not perfect, but I'm still in the perfecting process. And sooner than later, I'm going to be exactly who God called me to be. His strength is made perfect in my weakness. I, I want to preach a whole sermon on that exact scripture. I want to sit here and just talk about the fact that God's strength is made perfect in my weakness. Basically saying he's never more like God than when we are weak. What are you, meaning that's when he gets to do what he does best is when we get to say, God, I'm here in the middle and I'm stuck and I don't know what to do and I can't handle it anymore. And God's saying, hey, hey, call on me. Let me in. Let me in. I'm going to take care of it for you. It's a process because God has made us that way. We were made in the image of God. God is three in one. We know that. Well, you are also three in one in one. You are a spirit housed in a body and you have a soul. Your spirit, the inner core of your being is sensitive to God. It's a part where the Holy Ghost takes over when, he, when you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Your body, nerves, cells, brain, organs, that's all in your body. Your soul, is that's the complicated one. Everybody say complicated. 
That's your, your will, your choices, your conscious mind, which is your thinking and your reasoning, your subconscious mind, which is your beliefs, your attitudes, your feelings, your emotions. That's all in your soul. Some of you have a little bit more soul than others, though. I saw from y'all clapping early on <laughs> during the worship. I was like, uh, oh, somebody's got some more. They don't have much soul, but that person's got plenty of soul. A lot happens in our soul. So you're deciding to give your life to God and you're going to commit yourself to him to change your citizenship. And as soon as you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, your spirit comes alive. Your body, not so much. Wouldn't it be fantastic you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and you get a six pack right off the bat, man? Wouldn't that be cool? It's like, woo! Your body just gets transformed right there, right here at the altar. You know this place would be jam-packed. We'd be having the Colosseum full every night. It's like, God, I have got the perfect plan for revival. We just, <laughs> new bodies right here. New bodies, new bodies. Come on, everybody, new bodies. Well, what happened? No, not really much happens with the body. That's the physical part. My soul, that is the middle seat. Everybody say the middle seat. In my soul, I have the pain of my past. I have my thoughts. I have my emotions. I have the things I've done. I have the things that have been done to me there. That's the middle seat. We have to allow the same spirit of God that changed my spirit in an instant to change my soul through a process. The same Spirit of God that had the ability to change my spirit and align my spirit with His to change my soul, which houses all of my pain, all of my emotions, all of the thoughts and all the things of my past, that same Spirit needs to change my soul through a process. That's God's design. That's why God didn't say, to the Israelites, you know, beam me up, Scotty, from the Israelites where they were to the promised land. Just boom, right there. Boom, boom, and just send them, teleport them all over there. Why wouldn't he do that? Wouldn't that be fantastic if he did? Wouldn't it be glorious to watch God just take a whole group of people and transport them to another, to the promised land? Why didn't he do that? He wanted him to, he wanted all those people to trust him daily for the manna. Trust him daily for the pillar of fire to lead them by night. En route to the promised land, they say the most ridiculous statement. I mean, did, when we read it earlier, did some people here say, my word, children of Israel, what is your problem? Lord, take us back to Egypt. Before we laugh at the children of Israel and before we get too judgmental there, we should take a good look at ourselves. What makes us want to go back? The frustration of freedom is what I call it. It's so much easier to go back to what is familiar than it is to walk forward by faith. It's so much easier to go back to what we've always known than it is to walk and trust with God for what's ahead. We always want what's familiar. Guys, let's go to, the, go to a restaurant that you go to fairly regular. What do we do? I, the restaurants I go to, they don't even ask me what I want anymore. They just bring it out many times because I get the same thing. That's often what we do. We find a restaurant where like, you know, this is what I want. This is what I like. Somebody says that you're with, you know, you really should get the steak here. It's, it's just glorious. And you're like, no, 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 I like the salmon. I'm going to stick with the salmon. And we want to stick with whatever we've got. And we do that no matter what. And God's saying, you're doing the same thing with your life. I've got so much better stuff planned for you, but you continue to revert back to what you know and what you're comfortable with. children of Israel felt safer with what was familiar. They say, yes, Egypt was bad, but at least we had a schedule. Egypt was bad, and I hated it, but at least I knew I was going to get whipped every day at 3 o'clock, and I was going to go home, and I was going to get up, and I was going to do this again tomorrow. At least I knew what was going to happen tomorrow. Let me tell you a real fear that's on many of you sitting in this room today is the fear of the unknown. 
scared to death to know whether or not I step out in faith and God, I just don't know if I should take this step. I don't know if I should really go to this next level with you because I don't know what it's like on the other side. God is saying, I called you not to walk by sight. I called you to trust in me and walk by faith. Somebody say faith. faith. You have to trust him while you're in the middle seat and you have to keep walking. The children of Israel, they had to believe that whatever was in front of them was far greater than what was behind them. They have these gazelles that they would house in a zoo. And there was a wall that was approximately maybe four foot high. Have you ever seen like a deer just jump over a six, eight foot fence? Just pew. I've seen it a lot out in the woods, and you know, it's crazy. They, those guys can jump like crazy. Same with gazelles, and they had no problem. Four-foot fence, four-foot wall, no problem whatsoever. And then the other side of the wall was a little bit lower, so just, just their side was four foot, and then it was a little bit lower. And somebody asked, well, how, how come they don't jump out? What, what, what's keeping them from jumping out? And the only thing that was keeping those gazelles from jumping out was the fact that they had to see where they were going to land before they would jump. They had to see the other side before they would be willing to take the jump. And too many of us here today, God is saying, I'm wanting to take you to your promised land. I'm wanting to take you to the next place in your walk with God. I'm wanting to take you from this new place or where you've been stuck at for so long, but you are not willing to make the jump because you can't see everything with your own eyes. Today, God is wanting to do something powerful, something great in your life, but you have to be willing to take the jump. In closing, there's a police dog I want to tell you about. He specialized in high-speed chases. They would send this dog after suspects, and this dog would chase after the, uh, them on foot and one day this dog bolts out into a busy intersection and the cars are flying by. The car didn't see this dog and slams on the brakes, but it's too late. Boom, hits the dog. The car hit the dog and the impact was so intense that it completely crushed the dog's hind legs. The dog survived the incident, the accident, and it affected its walk. It caused the dog to flail its front legs and drag its back legs behind. And they didn't realize this, but when it was hit, the dog was pregnant. And the dog gave birth, though, to these perfectly healthy little puppies. And Nothing was wrong with them. They were, they were just fine. Their legs were fine. But after they were born and they started to walk, the veterinarian that was helping them noticed that as they would try to walk, they would flail their front legs and drag their rear legs behind. And the veterinarian had the hardest tr time trying to get these puppies to realize that there's nothing wrong with their legs. You've just been walking out the dysfunction that's been modeled in front of you. The veterinarian began the process of teaching these puppies how to walk the, white, the right way, the way that they were created, the way that they were fully capable of walking, the way that they were designed to walk. Let me ask you this, how and why did you come here this week? Why are you here today? Why do you read your Bible on a regular basis? It's because we're in a process. We're here today because we're saying, God, I'm in a process and it's uncomfortable. And God is saying, I want to teach you how to walk the way you were designed to walk. I want to teach you the way that you were designed. How is it that you are still dragging those legs when you have perfectly healthy legs? He's saying, I've got a plan for you if you'll just let me teach you. So, so many of you here today, you've been living out the dysfunction that was modeled in front of you, maybe from your parents, maybe from a family member, maybe from your own life. You're living out this 
model that was in front of you of kind of maybe barely making it in some areas. Sure, we love God. Everybody in here loves God. Everybody here wants to do the right thing. And, and I believe we're going to make it to heaven, but he's saying it's not. I don't want you to just kind of drag your hind legs into heaven. I want you to live a fulfilled life here on earth to fulfill the purpose that I've got for you. What I'm asking us today is don't give up because your destiny is much greater than your history. What you have, God has for you is so much greater than what you could imagine, what you've got planned even for your own life. I'd ask if you'd stand with me now. Today, I want us to raise our hands and say, God, please help me to live out what you've asked, what you called me for. Help me to do, God, what you've ask me to do help me God to live out the purpose that you have designed for me I'd ask those in the altar today that they would come and join me in the altar maybe all of us I I think that would be fitting to say God no matter where I'm at today I want to be find meaning in the middle I'm not where I used to be God and I thank you for it but I need something more in my life I need you, God. I need something more than just being stuck here. I've got to find the purpose that you've called me for. His strength is made perfect in my weakness. Somebody here today may need a flashback, may need a reminder, God, thank you for what you brought me from. Thank you for what you're doing in my life. Thank you, Lord, for the blood over the doorpost. The death had to pass over me, but today, God, I'm ready and I'm needing you to take me through this process. I'm needing you, God, to give me strength in the middle. I'm right in the middle, God, and I feel I feel trapped sometimes, God, but today I need your help. Somebody raise your hands and say, God, I need your help today. On behalf of Pastor Joe Forbush and the Pentecostals of Richmond, thanks again for spending time with us today. God bless.